complexity about modeling complex systems with Go and React. So technically speaking, I don't really need to give this talk or do anything of this with uh, Go, no React. But uh, it's something that I think is, is it's pretty interesting. Then uh, Go is something that you can actually actually do this with. Um, most of the time when we actually use technology and uh, I assume everyone here is a, an engineer, right? right. I, I only know, I just don't know three guys, the rest are actually. <laughs> um, and most of the time when we use these technologies, we, we write business systems and uh, we actually help the business to deliver um, systems that generate money. But I wanted to give talks like this to showcase that we can use technology for other purposes as well, for many other different things. And one of those things that I want to talk about today is um, using technology to do some investigation, some experimentation on complexity. Uh, complexity being, so or sometimes called complexity science, being uh, a science that talks about the behavior that emerges from a group of interacting parts. And this is not directly resulting in the interactions between individual parts. It's a bit wordy. Um, one of the <coughs> examples, analogy that I want to give is with this. Uh, I know this looks strange. Do you, what do you see in this picture? A dead dog. Dead dog, okay. There's a lot of people have man hidden in the picture. Oh, yeah. If you look at the whole picture itself, it's a portrait. But if you look at individual components, then you see there are two people in the top. Yeah, so it's an optical illusion, right? Um, and again, most people do not would not use an optical illusion to depict complexity science, right? It's, complexity science is not an optical illusion. That's not the, <laughs> what I mean. Uh, but what, what I wanted to show here is that if you look at it from a certain way, it looks like an, a portrait of a, an old man, right? But you look at it from a, a different angle, you look, it actually consists of two people, one old man and uh, a lady carrying a baby, and then a dog lying down on the ground, probably, probably not dead. Um, <laughs> sleeping. <laughs> probably sleeping. So they, they are characters, if you look at them individually, they are different, but if you look at it from uh, from a whole, is actually a different kind of character. Hey, more people, welcome. <laughs> right. So, complexity science is somewhat like that. It is not exactly the uh, absolute uh, analogy, but it's just that if you look at it from an individual point of view, you will see something. But if you look at it from a bigger picture, it actually becomes something else. Right. So that is uh, <coughs> the idea behind complexity science. So I'm going to talk about three cases of how. Um, complexity science can show us something interesting. And um, first thing, it's about something like, uh, what would you do under these circumstances? Right. In uh, 1964, a 19-year-old girl called Kitty Genovese was murdered uh, by a vagrant. Uh, she just recently graduated from high school. She was working as a a bar manager in a bar, and she was going home after work. One day, she parked the car, came out of the car, was approached by a man. She tried to run away. The man chased her and stabbed her a couple of times. And uh, when she was stabbed, she screamed out that, help, help, I'm being murdered. Apparently, the place where she was stabbed was actually in front of an apartment complex, and uh, the windows were open in most of the, these, uh, the apartments. And obviously, there were, it is a time where most people are at home, so it is most likely that a number of people saw her as well. It was reported that 37 actually saw the murder, but none of them called the police. She bled to death in front of her apartment. Right. So that's like 51 years ago, right? kind of cold-blooded, is that what's happening to society and everything. But more recently, in 2011, um, in China, a uh, two-year-old girl called Wang Yue was hit by a van in a city in, in China, then uh, ran over by a large truck. And 
there were a large number of bystanders who also watched that happen and didn't do anything. Um, she was left lying there for about seven minutes before finally somebody came in and helped her. But uh, unfortunately, she also died uh, a few days later. So you look at these tragedies, you see that, hey, what's happening in this society? Why, how can people be so cold-blooded? Is that what civilization is coming to? Is it like the end of the world? Right? Why are these things happening? Uh, if you were one of them, would you have helped? So some of the questions you could come to mind. Uh, this is actually a, a known phenomenon in um, uh, sociology, social sciences, and so on. It's called the bystander effect, where uh, if, if it happens to have a lot of people seeing the same thing at the same time, uh, you would expect maybe somebody else to maybe call the police or help, right? Because if the more people uh, happens to be around, um, it is less likely that the person will be helped. Right? So this is actually a well-known phenomenon. And uh, one attempt to explain it is <coughs> using game theory. Um, anyone here knows what game theory is? <coughs> no? So different uh, entities, uh, A and B, and if I don't do something, then we have some strategy to fit to... Uh, it's, it's, it's something like that. So obviously it's not really about games. Uh, it is about playing games. Do you too. use probability in this aspect? Yes, you do. You do. Um, so it's actually a... a mathematical uh, study uh, that studies models between people, uh, conflicts and cooperation and it's often used in economics and political science. It's, a, it's mathematics essentially, right? there's actually quite a lot of mathematics so it sort of forewarns you of what will come in a while. Uh, specifically the, the model that we're looking at for bystander effect is a model called the uh, volunteer's dilemma. Right. And um, it is not just found within humans, it's actually found in nature as well. Uh, this animal is called a meerkat. Uh, most popularly, probably you first seen of this in uh, Disney's uh, Lion King. Right. <laughs> the character is actually a meerkat. Um, so the meerkat has one very interesting um, behavior uh, that sort of illustrates what the uh, volunteer's dilemma is. So during time when the meerkat forages, for food, uh, one or more meerkats will actually act as a kind of sentry, right? and they will stand up like this uh, to make themselves look taller, and then just look around to uh, to see whether there's any predators around. Right? Uh, if there's a predator, what will happen is that the sentry will will let out a cry or a warning to warn the other meerkats to run away for safety. Right? But you can realize that the dilemma here, the volunteer's dilemma, once the meerkat actually cries out, right, a warning, obviously the predator would target the meerkat, right? So if there are a few sentries um, and they saw the predator, would you run away first or would you um, sound out a warning? Right? Because sound out a warning, uh, you see the predator, of course, the safest thing for you to do is run away, but uh, of course then the other uh, meerkats will get hunted, might get hunted down. Or if you sound out a warning, then you, might, you yourself might get hurt, right? So, this volunteer's di uh, dilemma. Um, your altruism is actually not rewarded because your altruism might be uh, sort of very fatal for yourself as well. Right? So that's in nature. Um, but let's go back to the model just now on the, uh, the murder of Kitty Jonamisi. And uh, let's look at the mathematical model in uh, modeling, the, or modeling what happened. Right? If you look at V as being the value gain if one person volunteers, C as the cost for volunteering, and A as overall cost if no one volunteers. And then we draw a matrix, what is called a payoff matrix in game theory. So you have a matrix of, for two people, let's say there is um, there are two other people, and both you and I um, saw the murder, right? Um, what happens? If I volunteer, and you volunteer, obviously, if I volunteer here. This is the uh, value gain for volunteering. And of course, if you, if you uh, volunteer, this is the cost of volunteering. Right? So it's V minus C. And here is V minus C as well. 
if I volunteer, is V minus C, but you don't volunteer, you get the full value, right? You get the benefit, but you don't actually uh, suffer the cost, and so on and so forth. So this is a payoff matrix for two players. Um, so here, if I volunteer, this is V minus C, and if I don't volunteer, this is V. If I don't volunteer, but you volunteer, so I get the full value of V. Uh, if I don't volunteer and you don't volunteer, so we get V minus A instead, A being the uh, cost of uh, the, the bad thing happening overall, right? So from this, we want to achieve a equilibrium called the Nash equilibrium in game theory, where these two sides equate with each other. So you have V minus C <coughs> equates with the P, where the P is the probability of volunteering, uh, times V, the value of cost, plus one minus P, V minus A. So this is the uh, uh, equation for a mixed strategy for Nash equilibrium. Okay so far? That's for two players. Now if we extend it a bit for n players, the so probability of volunteering is p to the power of n minus 1. And the probability of not volunteering is 1 minus p to, n, to the power of n minus 1. Right. The, the whole total equation assuming there are n people in that particular game or in that particular scenario, uh, this is the equation. It looks complex, but actually it's, it's not really very complicated. It's just simple algebra. Uh, you break it down, and what you get is the probability equals to 1 minus cos over a uh, to the power of 1 over n minus 1. Right. We have a formula now for this particular uh, game. So what we're going to do next is to do some Monte Carlo simulations. And of course, the obligatory code. And this is really the code I'm going to show you later. Yeah. And I will actually run it for you and you can see how, how it runs. Okay, sorry. Why does it not? Okay, I forgot. Um, Okay, so volunteers dilemma, um, number of agents and number of players. See, we see, you see this, uh, this overall cost, we're going to move this around, and here, the number of agents as well, the more people it goes. Now let's look at this, the uh, first one is, the volunteer cost. The cost of volunteering. Now the cost of volunteering is low. What do you see? The probability of actually somebody volunteering is pretty high, right? It's close to 100%. Um, as the cost increases, you can see the probability drops until it hits zero. Yeah, and this is obvious. If it's, it's actually so costly for an individual volunteer, the more costly it is, the less likely somebody will volunteer. Right? Now, if it's overall cost as well. What is overall cost? It means it's so costly, okay, it's so costly overall that um, the bad thing that happens if nobody volunteers. Right? If the bad thing is so bad, then you can see obviously the bad thing is so bad, the worse it becomes, then the more likely somebody will volunteer. Yeah? That make me say, makes sense too, right? Uh, and of course, if the overall bad thing is bad, if it's basically meaningless, whether I volunteer or don't volunteer, if the bad thing happens, it doesn't ha happen, it doesn't matter. Then obviously nobody will volunteer. Yeah? So that makes sense too. So what I'm trying to get at is, yeah, the model makes sense. Um, and of course, you look at the here, the agents, or the uh, players, the, the more players it goes, you look at this. Any difference? It's no different. What it tells you is that really it uh, doesn't really matter how many people are there, right? So let me come back to the uh, the presentation. If I could find my cuts. Uh, okay. Okay. Let's look at some of the uh, 
Thanks. And this is what you saw just now. Conclusions. Now, this is conclusions um, from what I derived from the chart. How do we improve the volunteering? How do we make sure that more people actually volunteer? So, obviously, you decrease the cost of volunteering, right? Make it easier for people to volunteer. Uh, and why do we want to do that? Because we want to actually make it less likely for such tragedies to happen. Uh, increase the overall cost of not volunteering, which means that the uh, cost of uh, nobody volunteering is so bad, so terrible, that people will want to volunteer. Of course, you don't want that, right? It's like, if nobody volunteers, there's going to be a nuclear war kind of thing. Of course, somebody would, would rush to, to volunteer. Um, increase the difference between individual cost and overall cost. So obviously, that's it. The, the difference is between individual cost and overall cost. Let me just quickly go back to this thing here. Um, you will look here. The difference here is about 75%. Um, but uh, let's say you put here. But you, as you increase here, you notice that's a difference as well, right? So the, the actual thing is that what you really want to do is to, what you really want to do, uh, oops, it goes back again, uh, is to really increase the difference between the individual cost and the world cost. Yeah. It's not to really like, decrease the cost, individual cost so low, because sometimes it's not easy to. Um, or increase the overall cost because, of course, you don't want the tragedy to happen. But you really to increase the uh, difference between the individual cost and the overall cost. Reduce the number of players. Uh, again, you look at the uh, this thing again, right? Uh, agents. If I really look at this, and I reduce it down to a, a very low number. You notice the probability here, 65, with three people, and probably it actually drops afterwards. What does it tell you? It tells you that um, actually with fewer people, it is actually more likely that somebody will uh, volunteer. But um, after a while, if you go up to here, the number actually doesn't change much, like 40, 40 something. But the initial part of it, you look, with just four people, is 55%, 51%. But after a while, it just drops to 41%, and it's still the same to the end. So from the charts, you can say that uh, if you want to, uh, if you want to encourage volunteering, you should consider reducing the number of players. And that could come in different ways. Like, for example, reduce the number of players doesn't mean if you, sometimes you cannot control the number of people on the scene, but maybe you can control the, uh, how people, as me as an individual, can see how many people are around. Right? So that's really what it is, not really just uh, absolutely how many people are there. And finally, the other conclusion we can see is that the increasing number of players have negative or no impact. Yeah. Okay, so far? Yeah. Right. So the next thing that I want to talk about, does anyone know what this cartoon is? Except Vincent will probably know for sure. Tintin? Tintin. Um, Tintin, this is Tintin in Congo, I believe. Yeah. Uh, it is obviously very, in, the, in, a, in an age where it's okay to depict uh, Africans this way, but probably not. Um, and there were people who were talking about Tintin being very racist, uh, but obviously, when you're growing up, you probably never think of it that way either. Uh, and this is something to do with what I want to talk about today. Um, a cartographer called Bill Rankin, he actually, what he did was he created a map of Chicago where each dot here represents 25 people. <coughs> and then he, what he did was he did a taxonomy of uh, race, right? And what you can see from this particular particular diagram, pink represents the white and uh, blue represents the black people. You can see very obviously that the whole city is very segregated by race. Yeah. Um, and you look Hispanic 
and the blacks and the whites don't actually mix. So Chicago people are very racist. But if you look at other cities in America, Detroit, it's like huge straight line here. Right? This is this straight line here. You look, this seems a bit more faded. It's more faded because it's, uh, let's say, Detroit is actually less people than uh, New York. Right? And this is why this is darker. Uh, one dot represents one person, 35 people. In New York, it's pretty much segregated the same way. Washington, D.C., less, but it's very obvious as well, left and right. right. East is more black and uh, west is more uh, white. Uh, LA is actually less, it's a bit more diffuse, but still you can see that there, there are like uh, a sea of Hispanics here, and then some blacks here, and then white people along the beach, beachfront property. Yeah. So, conclusion, Americans are racist. <laughs> But not really as well. Like so, you look at London. Um, this is from another chart, uh, a census of uh, ethnicity. Uh, a lot of blues, and the reds are actually segregated from the greens and segregated from the blues as well. Yeah. Um, and London is one <coughs> of the more racially diverse cities. But still, you notice people are actually segregated from each other. What does it tell? What does it tell us? If we actually go to other cities around the world, which I don't have the data, uh, I believe that's also very much true. People are segregated. Um, and we look at people in, in our region, right? You will also notice that there are more people who are... If you do not actually enforce certain rules, then people would tend to clump uh, with their own race, with their own kind of people. Right? Just like we are gathered here because we are all go lang <laughs> people. Uh, so people actually segregate here as well. Uh, is there a real study about this? Yes. And is there a reason why, why this is this way? There, there is this guy called Thomas Schelling. Anyone know who Thomas Schelling is? He's a Nobel Prize winner in economics. He's, uh, he's an economist. Um, he, one of the most popular papers he wrote was this Dynamic Models of Segregation, which talks about how people are segregated racially. Uh, his model is different from the one that I'm showing you today. Uh, basically what I did was I read his paper and I reinterpreted it in a slightly different way. Uh, uh, the model I use is one of uh, 36 times 36 grid, with each with an agent. Uh, and if you look at it, each agent, uh, each cell has an agent, and uh, each agent has eight neighbors, except for the corners and the sides, which we have, they would have less. Uh, let's take a look at the rules of how we, how we model this. At every tick, at every interval, um, check every cell. If at least n number of its neighbors are the same race, do nothing. And here, say, if I put the n to be 2, which, uh, if I have two neighbors which are the same race, I don't do anything. If not, I will randomly pick an empty cell and I'll move there. Basically, what I'm modeling is this. If I stay in this house and I notice that my neighbors, there are just two of them who are my race, if, it, if the N is two and I'm happy with that, it's fine. If now there's only one of my neighbor is the same race as I am, I feel unhappy, I will move. Right? So that's basically the rules. Uh, and I'm basically abstracting it down to that model and displaying it on the grid. So we're looking at the parameters. We have uh, N, which is the acceptable number of neighbors. R, which is the number of races on the grid itself. Uh, v, the percentage of vacant cells. And policy limitation. Should I limit the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, race to be of the same, uh, number of neighbors to be of the same race? Because as you know, if we live in HDB flats, sometimes, uh, well, you cannot have more than certain people of particular race and so on, right? Uh, what I'm trying to do here is to see, does it help to have policy limitations, right? Um, and what does it mean by being racist if I put certain number of uh, people within this uh, particular block, or rather put certain people there, um, would they still tend to clump? And uh, how racist am I? Right? Obviously, the uh, larger the, the N is, uh, the more racist you are, right? Because the smaller N means that uh, I'm okay for diversity larger N means I'm not okay for diversity. <coughs> right. And again, more obligatory code. And I can show you this. Yeah. 
Um, let me show you the second model, second creation. Right. So set up um, random. This is totally random. Let's say n is two, and there are two races on this grid. Uh, the percentage of we can see that twenty percent of the. Of course, it has to be a certain percentage because if all of them are occupied, then nobody can move, right? Um, and of course, the neighbors quota. I put to eight because the maximum number of neighbors are eight, so I put eight it means there's actually no quota. Let's see how it goes. See, from the original, if my acceptance maximum number of neighbors is just two, they would, they would actually um, be segregated, right? which means here that if even if my tolerance level is really high for um, racially diverse set of neighbors, it will still end up being um, segregated. <coughs> set it up again. Let's set up to one. See what happens. Do you notice what happens? Well, very little movement. Very little movement, which means that most people are pretty happy, right? So you will notice that the acceptable number of neighbors, maximum number is actually eight. So only with one, then there is uh, no segregation, which means really the, uh, you need to be really, really racially tolerant in order not to be segregated. And if you look, you remember the, the charts I showed earlier on? And that's part of the reason why you see that, uh, you see the, the, the chart seems to be very segregated. It's because it doesn't mean that, um, it doesn't mean that you're actually racist to be segregated in, in, in the city, right, uh, without policy limitation. Let's put this, let's say my, I'm highly racist, we set it up again. What happens? Everybody starts moving around, right? Huge jump. And they keep moving because why you will never stabilize. Because nobody's ever happy. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> keeps moving. So obviously this, this is not good. So let's go back to two where they, they actually uh, become together. So how about number of races? Is it maybe because there are two races, therefore they're like this? Let's increase the number to four races. Let's set up. But if they're highly racist and there's only two races, shouldn't they eventually settle like left, right? Uh, so that's that's the rule, is actually. Um, Especially if you run like one million simulations, sooner or later they might find. Uh, no, so so let's let's do that again. You're right. So so he, here the uh, movement sort of mostly stopped, right? Okay. So it's still segregated. It doesn't really matter in the number of races. Okay. So let's go back to here. Right. Um, Let's say two races, just two races. Initially, a lot of movement, and after a while, you notice that the movement actually dies down, right? Uh, down to nothing. So it's really this is really what it is. Yeah. It will not segregate like top down. It doesn't. But just like switching position on. Oh, it was switching positions because people were trying to find uh, a spot where it is acceptable for them. But after a while, they just stabilize with this, and they're not moving again. See, nothing actually moves. Nobody is actually moving. Everybody found their spot in the world, and they are happy there. It means they are actually segregated now. Okay, let me show what this sound is. Uh, let's say I increase the number, amount of vacancy. Again, there are lots of space for people to move. But you notice after a while again that it actually uh, clumps, right? It actually gets segregated again. So the amount of vacancy doesn't help either, right? Increasing doesn't really help. Now let's look at uh, uh, this quota. Just now there was no quota unlimited, right? Let's limit it. You cannot have five which are more the same as uh, that they are same as you. Uh, set up. What happens? In 
never stops. Yeah, because everybody's unhappy, but you still cannot stay with the same people. It keeps moving. Right. Um, so does the policy actually help? Well, it does help. But the policy cannot be too extreme. You notice here it's a little bit more diverse. Um, sure, I can really remember what's the best number. And there's a certain point in time where there would be stability, um, but it would not be uh, segregated. This is not acceptable either. But you notice the movement is actually less than previously. Probably the best number is, uh, is seven. Of course, these are all integers. Um, if you look at a bigger grid and, and a different set of parameters, you'll probably uh, settle at a certain number. Right? So the conclusion is, let's get back to the slides. So segregation do happen if even there's a weak preference for <coughs> neighbors of the same type. Um, the weaker the preference, the less segregated. So if the more preference, I just I didn't really show just now somewhere in between. It's not show two, uh, and I show five, n is two, n is five. But if it's somewhere in the middle, actually what happens is the segregation becomes clearer. I can actually show you. You see, <coughs> it took, takes a while, but it does stabilize, right? It stabilizes, and you see this is actually uh, less segregated than uh, with the quota is, is eight. Uh, let's okay. Now let's show three. Just now, let's set up this tree. You notice the segregation; it's more distinct, right? The clumps are actually bigger. Yeah then n equals to 2. So you look, you look at this, after a while it's stabilized, but let's say n equals to 2. The clumps are smaller, the segregation is smaller. And this is what I meant here. <coughs> um, the weaker the preference, the less segregated. The stronger the preference, the more segregated. At a particular threshold, the stronger preference results in an unstable but non-segregated state because everyone keeps trying to move around. Number of races have no impact. Number of vacancy cells have no impact. And policy efforts has limited impact. <coughs> but and if you try to impose a very strong policy, what happens is just an unstable state. Right. So, the last piece that I want to talk about is Clash of Cultures. I got this actually from a game. There's apparently a game called Clash of Cultures. Um, yeah, I got this from there. You played it before? No, I played it as a clans game. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, funny picture I got somewhere. People turn up at a football game and talk about different things. <laughs> and really what I talk about Clash of Cultures here, right? Um, Mickey Mouse in Japan. This is uh, Avengers in Hindi, Starbucks in Beijing. This is, I think, in the Forbidden City. Uh, of course, we talk about American culture invading other parts of the world. But we also talk about other parts of the world invading uh, US, right? So yeah, <coughs> Chinese food in, uh, in US, which is actually not Chinese food. I've eaten some of these before, it tastes horrible. And of course, yoga in, in U.S. in popular culture is not exactly the yoga that's practiced in India anymore. So what, is, what am I trying to say here is that cultures do um, clash and do diffuse with each other. Um, and uh, yeah, pizzas as well, the origin of pizzas and pizzas that you ate. This, I don't know what kind of pizza this is, it just looks horrible. It's an American pizza. <coughs> There is, a, there is a paper written by this guy called uh, Robert Axelrod. 
He's a political scientist and also a complexity theory researcher. He won prizes before. So he talks about how culture disseminate uh, with each other within cultures and how um, cultures interact with each other. Do they clash? Do they absorb each other? And how does one culture transform into another culture? Again, the same thing as the, uh, um, the previous uh, experiment I ran. I took his ideas and I sort of re-implemented it in a slightly different way. Yeah. Of course, um, Robert Axelrod never actually imp imp implemented this in this way at all. So, um, if I look at culture as being a set of features and the trait being a possible value set of features, right? so what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to create some agent-based modeling where uh, each agent represents a different culture. Right? So if you see uh, on the grid that again I will show you, each cell has one agent and uh, that agent has a particular, represents a particular <coughs> culture, right? uh, whichever culture you're talking about. Uh, and every culture has six features, right? so zero, one, two, three, four, five, and each feature has uh, 16 possible traits. So we look at this, what do you see? How do you think I can represent this? Two, like two digit code. Right? It's actually, I cheated, right? It's uh, color, color codes, it's hex colors. No. Um, basically, I have six features one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, each feature is a uh, hex number, it's basically zero to <coughs> F, six, uh, 16 numbers, zero to F. Um, and of course, as the numbers change, then the color actually change uh, ever so slightly. As before, eight neighbors per cell. And the rule, what happens is that um, agents who are similar to each other will interact and become even more similar to each other. This is how cultures <coughs> work as well, right? You have two cultures uh, who are geographically near to each other. They will influence each other and then after a while become more and more similar. Right. So the rules for the simulation, again, uh, every tick I'll randomly pick a uh, n number of cells and I compare the features of one culture with its neighboring cultures. If the trade difference is less than T, the trade difference here is T, uh, then I randomly select either culture and copy one trait of the feature into the other culture. Basically, it means that both cultures are become, become more uh, similar to each other over time. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this is how it works. So you have A and B were neighboring cultures. Um, and I compare every one of these uh, traits. So five and two, difference is three. You add them up together. So the difference between the uh, two cultures is 34. Right? If the cultures are 100% different from each other, is like black and white, then you have 100% is 96. If uh, the difference is zero, means they exactly each other, means both of them are the same color. Um, that will be zero. Right. So more similar the cultures are, the more likely there will be cultural exchange. Yeah. So if let's say, you look at the real life for example, if uh, the culture in one place and the culture in another place, they speak the same language, it's more likely that then uh, certain traits will actually in, uh, be absorbed into each other. Yeah. Uh, so what we get is the probability of the cultural exchange is one minus the difference between the uh, two cultures divided by 96. Yeah. Simple formula. Um, that's the probability. And when there is cultural exchange, this is what happens. Five here, we copy it over to five here, and then the color changes here. Right. So let's look at the final simulation, and I'll need to copy this thing here as well. Why do I need that? You will see in a while. Okay. So, set up. Randomly, just set it up to different cultures on a 36 by 36 grid. Let's start. You see the uh, blue here is the distance between two cultures. The red here is the, the changes. 
right? And uh, the ratio is the number of uh, uh, unique cultures. So what do you see here? Obviously, the change, it keeps changing, right? Because culture keeps clashing with each other, mishmashing and exchanging ideas and so on. Um, number of uniques drop, which means as the cultures mix, they are actually less and less unique cultures. Because originally, is the, the whole grid is full of all unique cultures, right? Every one of the cultures is different. But as time grows, the number of unique cultures actually drops. Um, the distance between the culture actually drops as well. So initially, every culture is very different from each other, right? the, the distance. Uh, it drops, but you will notice that the number of uniques actually drop more over time. Yeah. Uh, while the uh, distance actually do not <coughs> drop over time. This actually takes some time to run, so I, I won't actually go to this. I'll just go back to the slides and uh, show you some of the conclusions. So this is actually what happens. At one point in time, the distance will probably, over a long time, it will probably drop down to zero. Uh, changes will drop down to zero. The uniques will drop to a very low number as well. You know? What does that mean? It means actually it's <coughs> the dominance of one culture over other cultures, right? From a grid of 36 by 36, a lot of cultures, you will drop down to very few cultures. So, so do, do they, among the new, the last ones, are there actually any that is uh, part of the first set? Or ah. is a new? Yeah, so I'll talk a bit about that. So, um, average distance tells us how far apart the cultures are. Uh, unique how number of unique cultures changes how vibrant the uh, cultural exchanges are. Right? So after a while, there will be no cultural exchanges because they all the same. Um, so in conclusion, so eventually the equilibrium will be only a few dominant cultures. Yeah. Um, it will just be a few. You will not be like so many different cultures. Uh, dominant cultures can be very different from each other, which means that even though they are the uh, even though a few of them, it doesn't mean that they are all the same each other. Some of them can be very very different from each other. Right. And that's probably again one of the reasons why they are they are very um, dominant because you know they are very different from each other. Um, if I actually decrease the number of grids, you know, I don't have time to show you the number of grids because it involves some code changes. Um, smaller areas results in faster equilibrium. Uh, smaller the number of dominant cultures. If I have a very small grid, sometimes it can go up to just one dominant culture. Um, a culture that's more dominant at one point in time doesn't mean it'll be dominant yet. So what happens if you look over time, <coughs> the number of cultures, um, the number of uh, dominant cultures, so let's say at this point in time you see this, uh, let me just show you. This here. You see here the dominant culture here is somewhat like uh, yellowish here, right? Or this uh, light blue. And it could be very dominant over time, but after a while the, the light blue could actually go away entirely. So. Dominance, initial dominance doesn't mean uh, eventual dominance, yeah, because the cultures actually change over time. So that probably answers the questions, right? It's my dad calling me. Did I finish it? I think I finished it. So that was my last slide. I know it's kind of abrupt, but uh, yeah. And you can see this slowly right now, it's actually quite pretty. You want to see the code, uh, I can show you the code here. So, it's a web app. Um, <coughs> no third party libraries. <laughs> And the libraries. This is uh, the segregation is actually quite small. Uh, this is the volunteers again. It's really small, and this is the culture. It's big, big. That's why I didn't actually cut and paste the code in the. I did cut and paste the code in, in the slides. The uh, finance 
basically say react. Is it on GitHub? Not yet. Yes. Is it? I think it is. It is. So, uh, so it up after the year conference, right? Yeah. Um, actually, I can't remember where I put it up. Okay. Uh, you will be. You will be. Any questions so far? It's my dad calling me. I have to call him back. So, for this yeah. one, um, is there any uh, who's the dominant culture here? Is it um, random or can you uh, start off with some um, talking thing about dominant? No, it's random. So, initial um, initial cultures are all random. Eventually, even the cultures that are Yeah, so the initial set of cultures would not be the same set of cultures towards the end either. So it's not seeded, and the way the experiment is run, I also did not keep track of whether the, the culture actually, uh, <coughs> the initial set of cultures actually become dominant in the end. But probably it doesn't because all the cultures actually morph into something else. Which again is another one of the points here, right? Because whatever culture you start off with, do not expect it to be the, the one at the end. Like um, you see, the the American culture today is probably not the same American culture in the say the 1900s or the 1920s, 1950s, or the 1980s. <laughs> yeah. I think it will be helpful if you can draw some code logic in in time to your your demo because it was it was mostly demo and. There wasn't any code logic. of how, how, how you put that in the code and how okay. you, yeah, okay. no. I, I actually originally had that, but I was afraid that it would be a bit too long. Because like, I noticed the focus was more <coughs> on the demo and on the story, but mm. very little code logic. On the so code maybe like a little bit, as, as, you, as, you, as you demo, you can show a little bit of the code. Okay. More interesting. Okay. Good point. I think uh, that I, that's cultural for sure, but I think the race stuff can be uh, controversial in some uh, areas. <laughs> I mean, for example, in France, it's, uh, it's not really good to see uh, racial statistics and stuff like that. That's why probably it's a bit uh, it's a bit shocking. But I'm sure in India they don't really care, and probably it's normal. In Singapore, it's very normal. In the US, it's very normal. But it can be. I know that it, it could be a uh, Triggering some uh, some issues. Yeah. Okay. Good point. If I actually get to speak in front, I'll. <laughs> 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 what JavaScript Sorry. What JavaScript do you use? JavaScript files in the HTML section. Ah. Okay. Um. So this is one of them, this is the volunteers JS. So this is this is React. This is the React bit. Um, this is basically nothing much more than the container for the code. It's just the container for the code. Um, for the grid I actually use bootstrap. Right. So um, each grid it's basically uh, I'm basically using a CSS grid. And that's why you can see that I have a 12 by 12, 34 by 24, 36 by 36, 48, 48. I probably should have done this a little bit better, but yeah, I just like hacked it out. Uh, I can show you this. Those are all like React components. These are all React components. React components. See, I'm using uh, basically this is uh, 
probably don't need to, to put all of this, but this is basically bootstrap. And covering the, the background color. Uh, can you show the connection between the React and the Go part? Oh, the okay. The um, just like this is, if I click start, it calls culture slash start. And uh, culture slash start is basically this guy. Culture start. Culture start here. Basically, this this produces JSON, and uh, it emits to that guy. That guy takes the JSON, and then you would just uh, repaint this. Uh, and in JavaScript, I where is it? Uh, I have a set interval to every half a second. Yeah. Um, and then I would refresh the screen. That's how I got the grid. So the Go part network does the JavaScript. So at each point there are different states, right? Mm -hmm. So then as it runs, it will find So does the JavaScript tell the state to the Go part and the Go part process it and gives it back, or the Go part just JavaScript asks for the seconds, next state, next state, and the Go part stores the previous state and processes. So all the state is at the server. Okay. It will just emit and every half a second you will just grab the current state oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. the JavaScript the uh, the react part is all reader only it actually doesn't send any data back to the uh, the go you just emit so the experiment is actually entirely in code that's why I show you go code only right the uh, the display is in, in react I could actually do this some some other way as well right I could use like a mobile app and and, and sort of uh, get the data from there so this is all JSON data um, in the JSON data are actually quite simple. It's just a whole lot of numbers. Was there anything um, unique about using Go to do what you just did instead of using another language like Ruby? One thing is probably speed, to be honest. Yeah. yeah. I think I would have problems running. So I've not really tried this in Ruby. I only did this in Go. But uh, I did do agent modeling in Ruby in the past um, in my previous presentation about this. And uh, it, is gener it generally slows down a lot as the numbers become large. Whereas this guy is still chugging away you know, um, pretty fast. Did you make use of Go routines? No, I didn't. I could have done <coughs> Go routines in uh, more complicated agent modeling because then um, I could, each agent itself could be a, a separate Go routine. But that's not something I did for this guy. This one are more just different types of simulations. I could have done the whole thing in JavaScript as well. I could have done the whole thing in JavaScript as well. Yeah. Yeah. Are you using Go as well? Like, this is some terminal you can pin off uh, on the terminal. Yeah. On the terminal? Just leaves this display on the, like a metric or something. It probably so would be hard. possible, but I have no idea how to do it. <laughs> I would have to repaint it. Yeah. This, this was easier for me to do because you know it just emits uh, JSON and then I have a front end that will just keep on reading it at certain intervals. In fact I don't need to set it to half a second, I can set it every second, right? And it's still the same. You know, because uh, I'm just reading the state at that point in time, whatever state it is. It means that the data would be uh, there's two tickers basically and the good ticks on it on its side you will go tick on itself. And the JavaScript also JavaScript will take on itself. Also. You will just refresh at the certain intervals. Of course, it will look more um, jagged because uh, the data point that you take are actually far apart from each other. Right? So if you take it every five seconds, of course, uh, suddenly you see this is very random. So then after that, the next tick, it's like, oh, it's done. Right? Because in between, basically, it's actually done through a lot of iterations. Whereas your refresh rate for the JavaScript will be a lot slower. On, on both the server and the UI, um, you're, you're using half a second as the uh, no. size, no? No. On the uh, server on Go, there is no interval. It just loops itself. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, it just continually oh, so loops. What we see are not continuous states. It's just the state at 500 milliseconds. Yes, mm -hmm. correct. Yeah. So, of course, if I go down to every, say, 100 milliseconds, then I will see things to change a lot more rapidly, right? And it's more uh, contiguous mm -hmm. kind of change. 
if I set it to one second, then it, it seems more jagged, right? The change seems more abrupt. But it's still the same because whatever Go runs is at the back end. Um, yeah. Did you get the chance to like benchmark? So within 500 milliseconds, how many times Go was oh, it? I did, I did benchmark. Okay. I did benchmark. Because what I, I used to do in uh, Ruby in the past was I do I would run this and I would generate data files and then I would run a uh, another uh, program to generate the uh, graph out of it. <coughs> right? uh, so it's not real time when I used to do because Ruby it can be a little bit slower. Uh, but Go I'm actually doing this real time and React also allows me to do some refresh. But well, it's not really React. The JavaScript it allows me to do a lot of uh, refresh uh, quite rapidly. Yeah. And the chart thing is uh, done with uh, Google Charts. Yeah. Charting is done with Google, Google Charts. So it's actually quite fast. Everything actually runs pretty quickly. Okay. Any other questions? Any other feedback? Thank you for the feedback. But uh, any, other, any other feedback on the presentation? Have you tried using more variables in your uh, the in the models that we took? Right. Mm -hmm. You understand it's really simple. I can get it into my head. But mm -hmm. uh, to think about more, for example, even in this, apart from distance and uh, the difference in the races itself, there right. are a lot more factors which we can include one by one. Yeah, that's true. So that's true. Probably the next time, like hobby project, you could try more mm -hmm. factors inside and see how mm -hmm. complex it goes. I mean, yeah. if, if the my idea was that if there are more factors like that, mm -hmm. maybe the equilibrium that we see it's a little bit might different. not happen. Mm -hmm. There might always be some turbulence or something like that. Yeah, so you, you're right. Um, and I think so one of the reasons why why uh, it's done this way as well, I think it's, it's also done deliberately. Uh, I, I basically took an existing uh, paper and I interpreted it in a particular way, right? Um, and the parameters are actually from the paper anyway. But the reason why it's done that way is really to limit the number of parameters. So you can analyze certain parameters. It's like, if I change this parameter, what happens? If I change that parameter alone, what happens? Like, it's a science experiment, right? You maintain all the other variables the same, you just change one variable, how does it change? You know, so that's, that's the purpose of that. The more variables it, that I have, it's true, you can actually try different variables, but you know, it doesn't go away from the initial principle, which is to keep everything the same, just move one. Keep everything the same, just move one. Okay. All right. Thank you.